Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the epidermis. Okay, right, so we're currently in the process of discussing the basement membrane of the epidermis and how the basal uh, layer of keratinocytes uh, binds to the lamina lucida of the basement membrane. Okay, right, uh, so we've discussed that um, the way that this is performed is that uh, the basal keratinocytes have these cell adhesion molecules known as integrins in their cell membrane, and these integrins attach to the five laminin G-like domains of heterotrimeric laminins within the lamina lucida. Okay, uh, and uh, then on their cytoplasmic side, they interact with components of the um, cytoskeleton, basically. Okay, now we've discussed that most integrins, okay, so in humans we have 24 alpha, beta, heterodimeric integrins, okay, most of them attach onto the actin cytoskeleton within cells, in fact, 23 of them attach onto the actin cytoskeleton within cells, okay, and an example of one of these uh, which binds to actin uh, is alpha, 3, beta, 1, which is actually present within basal keratinocytes, okay, uh, now, we want to discuss the final uh, integrin, which doesn't bind to actin, but instead binds to intermediate filaments, because this is actually very important in these basal keratinocytes. So, let's talk about this final integrin then. So, this uh, is the alpha-6 beta-4 integrin. So, it's alpha integrin is alpha-6, it's beta integrin is beta-4. Okay, so let's discuss, draw this rather. Here is the cell membrane, okay, this is the extracellular fluid, the ECF here, okay, whilst well, so this is the cytoplasm inside the cell here, okay, we'll then have the alpha-6 integrin here, here's the amino terminus, here's the carboxylic acid terminus, and then bound to it, we'll then have our beta-4 integrin, Here's the N terminus, and the beta 4 integrin will have a longer C terminal tail than the alpha 6 integrin. So we'll have alpha 6 here in blue. Okay. We'll then have beta 4 here, and we'll color it in in green. Okay, right. So there we have our alpha 6 beta 4 heterodimer. Okay, right. Now this will bind to the um, five laminin G domains, um, sorry, five laminin G-like domains uh, of our heterotrimeric laminin here. And the specific heterotrimeric laminin, which the alpha-6 beta-4 integrin is capable of binding to, is uh, the laminin 332, which we've already seen. That was one of the ones which uh, alpha-3 beta-1 could bind to as well. So this is the laminin where the alpha uh, laminin is number 3, and the beta and gamma laminins are both the second type. Okay, right, so here are our five laminin G-like domains here of our alpha integral, uh, sorry, of our alpha laminin. Okay, right, so I'll colour these five laminin G-like domains in orange here. And you might wonder, well, why do the beta and the gamma affect it? Well, obviously it's more complicated than what I'm drawing here, okay? The C-terminals of the beta and the gamma laminins will also be around here, and they'll be involved in the um, interactions between these five laminin G-like domains and the uh, extracellular domains of these alpha-6, beta-4 integrin molecules here, okay? So don't think that it's only the alpha laminin that determines which integrin uh, the laminin can bind to, okay? It's more complicated than that, even though the five laminin G-like domains are within the alpha laminin. Okay, right, okay, so um, we now want to discuss how this uh, alpha 6 beta 4 uh, laminin, sorry, integrin, is going to bind to um, the intermediate filaments within the cytoskeleton. So basically, what's going to happen is a protein is going to come and associate with the carboxylic acid tail of our beta 4 integrin here, and this protein is called plectin. Okay, so we'll colour in the plectin protein here in vivid purple. 
and the plectin protein is then going to bind to intermediate filaments within the cytoskeleton of the cell. Okay, so we now need to discuss intermediate filaments. Now, uh, there are many different types of intermediate filaments that can be components of the cytoskeleton, but the most important uh, one of these intermediate filaments, especially since we're talking about basal keratinocytes, okay, is keratin itself. Okay, so keratin is an intermediate filament. Okay, now there's not just one type of keratin, there are a huge number of different types of keratin, but they all obey the same basic structure. Okay, which I'm about to describe to you now. So, what is the structure that intermediate filaments have? Well, Basically, you start off with a monomer out of which you are going to build your intermediate filament. Okay, so you start off with a single protein. Okay, so here is our single polypeptide here. Here's its amino terminus, and it's going to have a very large domain known as the rod domain. And this rod domain is going to consist of a right-handed alpha helix. So remember, if we view this as the top, it's going to go around in a clockwise direction. So at the moment, I'm looping out towards you. I'm looping back away from you. I'm looping out towards you. I'm looping back away from you, like so. Okay, so you'll have this going on and on and on, but I won't draw it that long. Okay, and then here is the carboxylic acid terminus here. So this portion here which consists of this extremely long right-handed alpha helix, which, remember, means that uh, from top to bottom you go in the clockwise direction. Okay, This is known as the rod domain of our monomer, which we're going to build our intermediate filament out of. So if we're talking about keratin intermediate filaments, there are a huge number of different monomers out of which you can build keratin filaments. I think it's something like 52 different monomers of keratin are known within humans. Okay, so the point is there is not just one monomer of keratin. It would be beautifully simple if there was, if there was just one keratin monomer, and that was the thing which out of which you build all keratin filaments. Okay, but it's not the case. There are a huge number of different keratin monomers. Okay, and a keratin filament is going to contain a huge number of different monomers. It's not going to be built out of just one type of keratin monomer. Okay, uh, but the important thing is that although all of these different keratin monomers will differ in their primary amino acid structures, okay, they all have this same basic structure where you have this massive great rod domain and they can all assemble into these uh, keratin filaments. Okay, so how is it going to work? Well, basically, we're coming back to something that we've seen already, which is the concept of a coiled coil domain. Because what we're now going to do is we're going to assemble these monomers into coiled coil dimers. Okay, so let me talk you through the concept of this coiled coil dimer. Okay, so it's the same concept as we saw before. We are now going to view this alpha helix as though it was just a strand. Imagine that that is just a string. Forget the fact that this is a piece of alpha helix, basically. Just let's now denote this alpha helix as a blue line. Okay, so we will now denote our monomer like so. Here is our amino terminus, here's our carboxylic acid terminus, and then in between we have this alpha helix, but we've forgotten it's an alpha helix. It's just a line now, and what we're going to do is fold this into another alpha helix, a grander alpha helix, a bigger, um, you know, we're zooming out effectively, we can't see the detail anymore, we can't see that this is actually an alpha helix, we're going to see a bigger alpha helix. Okay, so we're going to wrap this blue strand, which we can no longer see is actually an alpha helix, into a larger alpha helix. Okay, and this alpha helix is going to be a left-handed alpha helix now. Okay, so it's going to uh, loop around in an anti-clockwise direction, so it's coming out of the page towards you at the moment. Now it's going into the page away from you. Okay, now it's coming out of the page towards you. It's going into the page away from you, and you can see that it's 
circling round in an anti-clockwise direction, okay? If we view this as the top here, it's coming out of the page towards us, it's now going into the page away from us, it's coming out of the page towards us, into the page away from us, it's going round in an anti-clockwise direction. Okay, right, so it's a left-handed alpha helix. Okay, so this is one of the monomers. Now, in order to make it a coiled, coiled domain, we need to stick in another one that will intertwine with it. Okay, so we'll get another one of these monomers. It's also going to wrap around in a, a left-handed alpha helix. Okay, uh, but this time it's going to be in the opposite positions to these ones. So, it's going to start off here, let's say, and now this one here was coming out of the page towards us, so this one is going to be going into the page away from us, so it will go behind this blue one. Okay, now it's coming out of the page towards us, and it will go in front of the blue one here. Okay, because the blue one is right at the back now. Then it's going to loop back to the back. Okay, the blue one will be at the front, whereas the turquoise one will be at the back. Okay, then it's going to loop back out to the front like so. Okay, and then it will end with the carboxylic acid terminus here. Okay, so this is what's known as a coiled, coiled dimer. So it's a dimer of these two monomers of an intermediate filament. Okay, so um, going back to our keratin, uh, you've taken two monomers of keratin, you've intertwined them like so. And in fact, I might just, to try and get the point across even more, we could replace these blue lines. Let's say we can now see on the microscopic level now, okay, and we could replace these blue lines with our alpha helix, and I do apologize, I've just started drawing a left-handed alpha helix there, but of course this is a right-handed alpha helix, so let me be more careful and I'll try on this one now. So here is our right-handed alpha helix here, so this turquoise line, if we zoom in and look in more detail, this is in fact a right-handed alpha helix. But if we're zooming out, we can only see the fact that this is a strand that is uh, coiled with another uh, strand, and they're coiled in left-handed alpha helices, which intertwine together like so. Okay, so this is the structure of a coiled, coiled dimer. Okay, now, to construct an intermediate filament, we're going to have to aggregate a huge number of these things together. We know we're close yet. Okay, but we're going to go one step further now. So we're going to go towards an intermediate filament at least, so we're going to go to a tetramer now. Okay, so let me show you then the structure of a tetramer. So if I draw one of these coiled, coiled dimers here, okay, so here is one of those uh, left-handed alpha helices here. Here's another left-handed alpha helix here. Okay, we then have their amino termini here and their carboxylic acid termini here. So this is a coiled, coiled dimer. We're now going to stick another one of these here, okay, to form a tetramer. Now, we're going to offset them slightly, so they're not sitting side by side perfectly, they're slightly offset. We're also going to put the C terminals of this coil coil dimer nearer to the N terminal over here, and we're going to put the N terminals over here near to the C terminals of this one. Okay, so here we now have our tetramer consisting of four separate um, intermediate filament monomers. Okay, now what we're going to do is assemble eight of these tetramers together um, and then we're going to um, coil this round to make a tube basically. Okay, so I'm going to go down to representing this tetramer like so. Okay. So these two lines will now represent the tetramer. So this, a single purple line, represents a dimer, basically. It represents two monomers in this coil-coil dimer structure. So we're now going to assemble these into what I'm going to show you now. So we're going to take eight lots of them, and this is what we're going to form here. So here is one of these tetramers here. Okay, we've got another tetramer there, second tetramer. Third tetramer's here. Here now is our fourth tetramer. Then our fifth tetramer. Our sixth tetramer. Our seventh tetramer. And here is our, whoops, here is our eighth tetramer here. Okay, right. Now, what we're going to do is link this one here 
to this one up here to make basically a tube. Okay, like so. So we're going to link them round to form a nice tube, like so. So if I colour this in again, here we've got one of these tetramers here. Here's another one here. Okay, and it will go round and round, basically. And this is how we have assembled these tetramers together to make a tube, like so. And then what we're going to do is join multiple of these tubes together. You'll notice that this portion here can overlap with this portion here. So effectively, what we're going to do is we're going to take another one of these and stick it together, like so. Okay, and this is how we're going to aggregate these... Um, structures together to make a huge, great um, polymer, basically. You're going to put loads of these things together to make a huge, great fiber, basically. So what you're going to effectively do is, if I draw this simpler, you're going to take multiple of these tubes consisting of eight tetramers, and you're going to join them together to make huge, long strands. And these, then, are what are known as intermediate filaments. So basically, all intermediate filaments are constructed in the same way. Okay, you start with a monomer with a rod domain, and then work your way up through the coil coil dimer to the tetramer to this huge structure here, and then aggregating those together to make um, huge filaments. Okay, keratin is the key example of intermediate filaments. There are others, they're much more niche, uh, but keratin is the key example, okay? And the key thing to understand is there, are, there is not just one monomer out of which you construct keratin. There are a huge number of different monomers, okay? So in one of these filaments, there'll be a huge number of different proteins, basically, corresponding to the many different monomers. So you do not just make a keratin filament where you have one monomer in every single position. Okay, so this is what uh, these alpha-6, beta-4 integrins bind to. These are other key components of the cytoskeleton. Okay, especially in these keratinocytes, named because they produce keratin. They have a huge amount of keratin within their cytoskeleton. Okay, so basically, these plectin molecules, then, are going to bind to intermediate filaments. And since we're specifically talking about keratinocytes, this is almost certainly going to be a keratin filament. But more generally, it could be an intermediate filament. And that's how we're going to bind our alpha-6, beta-4 integrin to the rigid cytoskeleton within the cell. Okay, right. So that now concludes our discussion of lamina lucida. Okay, in the next video, what we'll turn our attention to is lamina densa, which is going to consist of type 4 collagen molecules. Okay, we'll then talk about what holds the two uh, layers of the basement membrane together, what holds uh, lamina lucida attached to lamina densa. Uh, and then what we'll move on to is the basal keratinocytes themselves. We'll see how they are unipotent stem cells and how they are responsible for the renewal of the epidermis.